what are you looking for and what what is the outcome that seems right. likely right. or no, no you, that's the right question you know looking ahead is you know i mean look the, the turning point in this crisis i think came on sunday um of, of this week uh earlier in the in the week uh, whatever that is the uh you know the 26th of march when netanyahu made i think a very uh, yeah, a blunder where he dismissed his defense minister who had said hey these divisions are coming into, into the army now when air force doesn't you know uh, reservists don't want to train right was never had that in 75 years they're always so proud of the military and uh, I mean, 70 percent of Israel's Air Force are reservists. And it's not just in the Air Force, it's in all other branches. And so the defense minister was shocked. And the chief of staff said, like, you know, they should just back off. Now, he can't say that publicly because he's in, in uniform. He's not allowed to. But the defense minister said it. And instead of saying, OK, that's your job as defense minister to warn, like when mm -hmm. you were asking Diane about you know the um uh you know the the arab states how they're going to react i mean will israel's kind of you know uh, will terrorists and in, in different parts and islamic jihad and hamas and hezbollah are they going to come somehow unite and say okay now is the time israel's weak israel's divided um so that's what the defense minister said hey i gotta say this publicly if people aren't listening to me privately and netanyahu dismissed him and that drove people crazy. I mean, they just went to the streets and the backlash is like, you can't do that to the defense mm -hmm. minister. He's the one guy in the system actually has security experience. He's been a military guy for 40 years, a general, deputy chief of staff. Um, and so so that's what, and then the trade unions got involved and they had a nationwide strike the next day. And then BB backed off um, and said, okay, I'll give it a month. I'll give it a month because now we're getting into the Passover uh, recess in the parliament over there and uh and so they are you know like if you're going to cool it now you cool it and then there's the israel independence which is the 75th birthday which is supposed to be this crown jewel moment so the question is like to your point diana's like okay where's what's what's it going to turn on can this israeli president herzog who's well respected is a lawyer he actually won mm -hmm. uh in the knesset there that's where they named the presidents as a ceremonial job he won in the biggest margin in history because he's very smart and he's very centrist and he wants to keep the country together. And people know that. And so his view is like, let's get people in a room. Let's talk it out. Let's have compromise. It's like this isn't like a, a garden variety policy shift. This is about shifting the rules of the game unilaterally. If we were playing baseball, we'd have to agree. You know, we're playing nine innings and we're, you know, I mean, there's certain rules you have to agree on. One side can't agree on rules. The other side doesn't. So Herzog is going to try to craft this compromise with with the representatives of the parties this month. It's not going to be easy. I think it turns on one big question, or maybe two, mm -hmm. is that at the end of April, when you know you basically crunch time, you know you're ending the recess. How does Netanyahu evaluate his political survival? And his polling data, he he like you know eats polls for breakfast. This guy, I mean he he's a big consumer of polls, and his his numbers are down. I've never seen this before. I've followed this for so many decades. He's down like about I don't know six, seven, eight seats out of thirty-two. That's a lot mm -hmm. in just a few months because the public says I can't believe this is BB. BB's got to think about what's good for the country. Yeah, and so if he calculates the polls are still lousy, in my view. He'll go to the hard, the hard line guys and say, listen, this is killing us, killing us. Yeah, we're losing on every front. We're losing internally. We're losing in the United States. We're losing everywhere. Let's just back off and cut a deal. If, on the other hand, is polling kind of starts drifting upwards and people, he'll t you know, his coalition people say, ah, you know, the, the protesters lost momentum over the over the month of April then they might want to push forward. So how he calculates political survival is crucial. And this is where the related point, I'll just say, and I'll finish on this, is the United States. I think whatever your views of, of the president and President Biden in our country, when it comes to Israel, the Israelis see him for the most part, uh, you know, as someone who's been at this for 50 years 
And Americans, between the novel and the experience, we sometimes go for the novel. But in Israel, they tend to go for the experience because they live in a rough part Biden of the world. Biden is the experience. And and so Biden, they think he's like a, a gut player. He he goes by his gut, and they, they feel him as um, he actually cares about this state. You know, going back from the Holocaust, and he takes his granddaughters to Buchenwald, and and they're teenagers, and he he proudly calls himself a Zionist. And there are a lot of Israelis wonder if in the Democratic Party there are going to be others like mm -hmm. Biden. And but so they he's got a certain street cred as someone who cares. And it was clear when he spoke this week he was speaking without notes, and the Israelis noticed that too. And they think this really comes from the heart. It comes mm -hmm. from the gut. It's mm -hmm. like, hey, man, I've been at this for a long time because I believe in the shared values here. And if if we lose the shared values, the shared interests are not going to carry us too far. And so I think it was like a cry from the heart. And I, he said to BB, like, you're not invited here until we sort this out. He didn't say until we sort this out. He said not at this time. I mean, he didn't say it that way. But I think when BB does that calculation, at the end of April, you know, that has got to be a key piece of this. Because in Israel, there's it's not like a lot of countries where there's like an anti-American segment. The whole country there is pro-American. Mm. And they don't want anyone messing with it. Doesn't mean they think the United States always gets it right. It doesn't mean they, they, they don't have issues. They had issues with President H.W. Bush and with President Obama and yeah. et cetera. But they basically do not want to be without the United States. So they don't like people messing with the relationship. So how Netanyahu does that calculation, how does he survive? Because he, he, he needs the hard right right now because no one is stepping in to say, hey, get rid of those guys. I'll come in. Uh, they don't trust him. I mean, Gantz, the, the, the former defense minister who's a centrist, who'd be the one everyone's focusing on now, and his numbers have almost doubled because he talks the language of unity, which is what the public wants to hear. They want to hear unity. They want to hear compromise. That's all they want. They don't want to be bothered with all the, the, the finer legal points. Mm -hmm. They just want someone to bring the country together. And he talks that way. But the problem was he joined Netanyahu during covid and and because he said there's an emergency and i've been a soldier all my life how can i not join they need me they need me and bb said yeah yeah we need you and i'll split it i'll be prime minister the first half you'll be prime minister the second half and then he said i changed my mind so now he looks like a sucker if he goes with netanyahu after the rug was pulled out from under him so it's very sad because he could have replaced these hard right people yeah and he, netanyahu would be back to flying the old plane again with with a wing this way and a wing at the other side but now he's flying with one wing it's hard to fly a plane with one wing it is it is and i i think you know to your point to end off you know the uh, the the sheer emotion we're seeing right now in israel does suggest a lot of people think that the the heart and soul of their their country is at stake and so That's I don't know if you feel that personally yourself as an observer. Yeah. How do you feel? No, I'm an American, you know, I'm not an Israeli, but I mean, watching it, no, this has been in some ways, watching. I think, an, a heroic moment for Israel, because we don't always see this in the United States of all these, you know, you know, if 160,000 or 220,000 just in Tel Aviv, and then in all these other 80 cities or towns, there's, there's others, but hundreds of thousands come out because... They're fighting for the character of democracy. They love democracy. And that's what America were about. So in some ways, you could say, look, this is actually a heroic celebratory uh, moment that the people made a difference. And they made a difference. They weren't, you know, demonstrating about left wing, right wing or any of that. They were just demonstrating as, hey, we're a Jewish state, a democratic state. We want to maintain our character. We don't like someone changing the rules of the game and altering our character. We we don't want our character on the chopping block. So it's, uh, I think in some ways, it's an incredible moment in time about, you know, human agency and of wanting, wanting to maintain the, the spirit that has made Israel, I think, so successful to have, that it's flourished for these 75 years. Yeah.